You know, thank you everybody for tuning in to this episode of the Black Trombone Chronicles. I am honored to speak with somebody that has influenced my composition and trombone playing quite a bit. That's the great Robin Eubanks. And if you don't know who Robin is, Robin comes from an amazing musical family. And in my opinion, he definitely revolutionized the sound of the trombone by incorporating electronics and different things like that into his live performance. So Robin, thank you so much for coming on this episode, man. How you doing today? Oh, good, good. Thanks for that intro. It's nice. You never know how how your what you're doing is being perceived or or received. Yeah, I just do what I do. And yeah, the chips fall where they may. <laughs> yeah, well, man, I'm glad you do what you do because the chips have definitely fallen in a good place. I'm gonna uh, get in a little bit more later in the interview about exactly how you influenced me um, and my compositions. But I'd love to for you to start by telling the audience a little bit about where you're from and how you got into playing the trombone. I'm from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania where I am right now, (laughs) visiting my mom. And um, uh, so, you know, I grew up in Philly and I'm trying to uh, um, remember how everything started. Well, back really started, I was eight years old in uh, like uh, fourth grade and um, some kids is around this time of year. Some mm. kid, two kids came into the uh, my classroom playing Christmas carols, mm. and one played trumpet and one played trombone. Mm. And um, uh, my mom is, is, a, is a musician also, and she was uh, used to teach piano lessons. Um, so she taught in the public school system for many, many years, but she had private students on the weekends on Friday and Saturday, and then she would do church on Sunday. She was the mm-hmm. choir director on Sunday. And um, so I got to hear music a lot, and, and they used to take us to see live shows all the time. I remember seeing James Brown and Stevie Wonder wow. and wow. all the Joe Tex and all the <laughs> wow. Supremes, all this stuff back in the uh, wow. real little kid, all mm-hmm. live music in a place called the Uptown, which was like the Philadelphia version of the Apollo. Okay. And um, all the other instruments, you can see how they're played, they're either played or struck or fingered or bowed and fingered or something like that. Mm-hmm. And on and you know you can you can kind of look at them and see how people how people are making music with them. But on trombone, I was watching this guy. He was just moving his arm back and forth. Hmm. I was like, "How do you make music just moving your arm back and forth?" <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't. I didn't have any finger, no notes, no keys, no vowels that I could that I could discern. Yeah. how he was doing it. So I was just very, I was a real curious kid. So at the end of the school year, they asked me to choose an instrument and out of curiosity of how it, figure out how it worked, I chose a trombone. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I took lessons during the summer. And then I came the, sep- the following September, I joined the uh, orchestra and, and band at the school, so. <clears throat> did it did it speak to you right away, like when you first started playing it, or more of it, was it that curiosity of like, how does this work? Or did the sound of it kind of speak to you right away? You know, I was just kind of doing it to be doing it. The, yeah. uh, it didn't, I mean, I wasn't in love with it. It was, it was nice. I used to put it away, because the first six years I played was all classical mm-hmm. lessons. Mm-hmm. And um, I used to put it away and play baseball all summer. Then I'd pick <laughs> it up again in September. And it wasn't until um, I started getting a little bit older. So if, let me see if I was four and six. Yeah, I guess around uh, eight to 14. Yeah, I guess I was in, in high school mm-hmm. is when I started playing it year round. 
because a band asked me to uh, join uh, their band. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was like, and we did this a gig. I said, you can make money doing this? (laughs) (laughs) I was just doing it because, you know, family played music and it was just something to do. I was in the band at school and I didn't, you know, I wasn't thinking that you could do anything else with it. This is yeah. the band and the orchestra. And then these, these kids, kids in the school asked me to join their band. They were playing like Chicago songs and all this kind of stuff. And I was uh-huh. like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's My awesome. interest changed completely. And yeah. I, uh, <clears throat> then I got started getting more serious about it. And, and so, you know, so it was. Yeah, in your. I was going to say, in your school program, in your music program at your school, were there a lot of uh, other African-American students playing trombone or period, or were you one of the few? There was, this was one of the advantages of of my, the education that I got here in Philly. I got one of like the best public school educations you could get. I was, Mm. um, that's when I I took, uh, I remember when I was in, I don't know how I remember all this stuff. I was in third grade <laughs> and um, I was like in the neighborhood school. Mm-hmm. And, and they, um, I remember they took me in, maybe they had some kind of testing, I don't remember. But I remember this guy asked me, he took me and he played the piano and he asked me to tell him which note was higher than in the next one. Mm-hmm. And if I could sing the note, it maybe maybe you asked me to do that because I mean, cause I was hearing music all my life. It, it was easy for me. Yeah. And then they saw that I had a little bit of aptitude with with music or something. And then they switched me. To, they they switched me to this. Um, they called it some kind of laboratory, exp- an experimental kind of school in Philadelphia, mm-hmm. and. Um, so I had to take the bus and go to a whole downtown, the mm-hmm. center city, to my, to the school. And I was, it, I was really young. I was like, like I said, I was around, around eight years old. And um, but uh, it was a school where where they had kids from all over the city coming. Yeah. So I was going to school with all, and it was very integrated situation from a very, very young age. Mm. And it was, you know, <clears throat> there's supposedly, you know, some of the top students in the city. And um, and I was in there with Jewish kids and uh, Quakers and Asians mm. and Hispanic. And yeah. so it was, it was, it was a whole homogenous kind of thing. So it wasn't as, and, and there was definitely black kids in the orchestra. There was I remember this guy named Joseph Ripley played trombone. When I when I went to the um, when I started um, back at school after uh, after that summer of taking lessons, and it, and it was a very it felt very natural and it was very integrated. And so I was I was on a very young age. I was. Um, in a way, I wasn't looking at it that way, but I guess I was like competing and 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 with with people from my age group from all races and and doing very well. So I never it was a very natural kind of right. uh, um, system for me to just integrate with everybody. I didn't feel um, like I was segregated or. Right. Or, or even to that degree, overtly, um, um, you know, stigmatized for being mm-hmm. a, a little black kid. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Do you feel like that kind of that kind of grooming stuck with you as you started to get older? You know, did you like once you went to high school? Was it a similar type of program, or what? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I went to, when I went to high school, I went to like the top public school in Philadelphia, Central High School. It was all male when I went there. Hmm. Actually, it was the same school. Bill Cosby went there, oh, and wow. a lot of you know people in Philly, my more 
And my ex, apparently my uncle went there, which I didn't know for a long time. My uncle, Ray Bryant, he's a pian- pianist. I didn't know that was your uncle. Yeah, my <laughs> mother's brother. Wow, wow. <laughs> Ray That's- Bryant. And, 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 and uh, when I do like uh, interviews and lectures and stuff, I always brag on my family, of course, because uh, you were saying how I had a musical family, but you know, Ray Bryant is my uncle and Tommy Bryant. Mm-hmm. And they're, they were both in the Papa Joe Jones trio. Yeah. And um, and they were they were on the album the Eternal Triangle with Dizzy and Sonny Stitt. Yep. yep. And um, I remember Papa Joe Jones used to come by our house because Ray used to had my dad on the apartment building, and um, Ray and his family was on the second floor, and mm-hmm. he, Papa Joe Jones used to come by the house and play the piano. Wow. <laughs> Ray, wow. didn't even, honestly, Ray didn't even have a piano. He used to come downstairs and practice on my mom's piano. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's that's nuts because I was literally just reading this book called uh, Three Wishes. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but it's a book that was um, the, she was one of the heirs to the Rothschild family. Um, oh, okay. I'm forgetting her name. And she was hanging with all the cats back oh, in the yeah. day. Uh, Nika. Nika. Yes, exactly. Nika. Which Nika's dream. Uh, Nika's like, dream was uh, so her, her silver roses. And yeah. <clears throat> there's like 20 songs written for her. I didn't. I didn't yep. Okay. Yep. I didn't realize how close the cats were to her, but she yeah. did this book and she went around and she asked all these different musicians if they had three wishes, what would they be? Oh, wow. And, yeah, and your your uncle is in there. Um, wow. I just read. Yeah, I got, I'll got. i take it up in a second and see what his wishes yeah. were. And one, one more bragging, 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 uh, family bragging rights thing. My mom, because, you know, Philly has so many musicians from Philadelphia. Yes. My mom was, was Kenny Barron's first piano teacher. Really? <laughs> Wow. <laughs> I, have picture, I have a picture on my computer of my mom. Wow. The Kenny gave me of wow. my mom t- teaching him a lesson. Wow. That's incredible. <laughs> That's incredible. Lots of, and, you know, and my, my brother Dwayne plays trumpet and he was in yep. Mulgrew's band and then yep. uh, Elvin Jones' band and Dave Holland's band. So, so. Yeah. Yeah, no, your your family is amazing. Your other brother Kevin that plays guitar, you know, the Tonight Show. I mean, I mean, it's just like <laughs> it, it's real deal. So I would imagine that all of that influence, like you guys, probably pushed each other a little bit, you know, just to keep getting better musically, you know, as you started to grow yeah, up. Well, Kevin and I, in particular, because he's um, uh, he and I are like two years apart, and then Dwayne and his brother. His twin brother Shane are like mm. eleven years behind mm. Kevin, even so, <laughs> or nine years maybe. Okay, okay. No, maybe it is eleven. Yeah, but, uh, but yeah, and so it was. So it was always music everywhere, and, um, and like I said, I I didn't feel overtly stigmatized or oppressed by it because I, I from when I was eight years old I was in school with and and competing and doing well with other kids from all these other races yeah it was just a much <clears throat> thing for me yeah as you started to move into higher education and going to college uh where did you go and what was that scene like? Was it similar to the education um, upbringing that you had to there where it was very segregated or now that you're in college now, now it's a little more, you know. Uh, it was it was integrated all the way through. Amazing. <laughs> now that I'm, the more I'm thinking about it, you know, from from when I was eight years old on from elementary, elementary school into junior high school and I I did a program where I took seventh and eighth grade together. So I kind of skipped Mm. eighth grade and went to ninth grade. And, um, and, and when in the high school was thick, it was central high school. uh, It was very integrated. And it was also another situation where they drew kids from all around the city to this particular school. And then I went to, uh, to Temple university 
mm. a few years and that was very integrated also a lot, my, a lot of my friends and we were all um we're in the band the marching band and all that stuff together okay. <laughs> then i transferred to uh what's now known as university of the arts that's where mm-hmm. stanley clark went there and jerry mm-hmm. brown and a, a lot lot of um people graduated from there a lot of musicians so they had a they had a good they had a jazz program there mm-hmm. and so i transferred the temple didn't have one then when i was uh when I was there. And um, so then I transferred to there. That was a little less, but still very, very, um, it was still integrated. And and, and by that time, you know, I was was feeling good about myself and everything that was happening. I was playing in bands. By that time I was, was playing in bands in the city and was, known a little bit mm-hmm. on the scene and yeah. uh, you know I started playing like funk and rock bands mm-hmm. when I was like 15 okay and uh, when I was still in high school that's like like when um, those guys in school asked me to join their band I think I was around 14 or 15 and um so I was playing in uh places that you had to be 21 to even enter yeah when i was 15 <laughs> yeah <laughs> Sim- similar in in miami I, I started doing professional gigs around the same age and there was this uh there's an area called coconut grove i haven't been there in so long it's probably totally different but there was a club like a you know dance club and they had this back room i think it was called like the iguana lounge or something and me and two of my other buddies used to play trio back there. We were 15. So everybody, the manager, everybody knew that. So they used to sneak us up the we elevator. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Rare setting. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. And this cat used to sneak us up this back elevator so nobody would see us, you know, walk in the door and we play our little trio <laughs> set and then sneak back out. Wow. It was <laughs> it was a learning oh, experience. It, 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 it was, it's, it's amazing, you know, you know, the, the stuff that you're exposed to if you're yeah. 15 and, and you have to be 21 to even go through the door. Yeah, <laughs> and we a band was kind of popular in the city. We played like every weekend, so I had wow. all. Yeah, I yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, to, to, I had so music was always always equated playing music and gigs with fun. Hmm, hmm. And, that's and that's positive, amazing. Very positive situation. So that's that's and I was making money doing it when I was yeah. fifteen and stuff. Yeah. I've, I've never had like a what a quote unquote regular job. The closest yeah. regular job I ever had was when I did Broadway. After mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think I worked. I worked in an art library for about 20 minutes and I did a uh, I used to work at a CD store, uh, HMV CD mm-hmm. store on 34th Street. I worked there for a couple of months and then I got a gig to go on the road and I was like, <laughs> you know that's that was it, was it for me. Very, you know, very. So you had a similar experience. It was very fortunate how, you know, at a young age, music became so uh, integral to what we were doing, and and it was an, an environment that was very encouraging. Absolutely, I, I, I loved playing gigs, and I still. Do. Um, yeah, yeah. I remember one of so <laughs> and traveling and yeah. One of my Girl. favorite gigs used to be this little, <laughs> get to that. One of my favorite gigs used to be this little uh, Italian restaurant and we'd make 60 bucks and the food was amazing. This is when I was a kid. Um, and I used to, I would do the gig just for the food at that time because I had never had any food that high end, like in that kind of setting. Um, still do it. It seems like I'm still doing some of those gigs. <laughs> for 50 bucks in food but you know it's a little bit better now um so as you as you started like working with these different or you more professional now did you ever find yourself in different settings that you were like the only african-american musician on the bandstand 
I'm sure I did. I'm trying to, you know, I'm, I, I'm, it's hard for me to remember specific situations, but I, I, I mean, I was played in so many different situations. I'm, I'm sure yeah. I, I was. I mean, I've definitely played in somewhere I was one of one or two. And that's been, that's been a lot, especially and, and including when I moved to New York. I remember sometimes I was, I was playing in the um, Grammy band when, when this, they used to alternate the Grammys between um, doing that Radio City and then in L.A. Mm -hmm. When I did it in New York, I used to play in a band with, that did that. And that was it was maybe one or two black people in that. And I did a tour with, uh, with Barbara Streisand. Mm -hmm. And it was it was it was like one of her, one of the first tours she did after like 20 years or something like that it was like this big deal and um i think i was one of uh very very few <clears throat> but it was a, a really good trombone section <clears throat> um jim pew was playing mm -hmm. lead and um Keith O'Quinn was playing yeah. second and i was playing third and dave taylor was playing bass trombone yeah. And they were all friends of mine, you know, people I was acquainted with had done get work with them before. So I was, it was very, felt very, very comfortable. Yeah. And that, and, and a lot of times I, because I was, grew up in such an integrated kind of situation and with schooling and everything like that, I'm, I may not have, sometimes I wasn't even aware of it. Mm. Sometimes I would, check myself and I said, oh, damn, I guess I am. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it after a while, but, but it, yeah. you know, I, did, I never felt um, hindered by it at all or in a weird situation. It, it just, it was. Yeah. Because I, I was so used to being in such an integrated situation. Yeah. And, um, and it definitely, I, I did stuff where I was a guest soloist with bands in Europe and stuff like that, where I was definitely the only black person. And I, I, I do recall that a lot. Yeah. I was, yeah. It's you know, just a, the people would invite me over to as, as a guest, the guest soloist in their band. I'm, I'm playing and I play in a band, an Italian band now. Mm. Uh, I did a recording with them last year or the year before. And, um, I guess this was last year, and I'm, you know, I'm the only, I'm the only American. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there, the only black cat. So, and, and you know, I'm like the special guest, and you know, everything's cool. Yeah, I think that early integration kind of fuels the because I'm I'm similar, you know. Um, when I was growing up, especially in Miami, like, you know, my best friends were like Spanish, you know, mm -hmm. like I had all, all different black, Spanish, white, still my best friends now, one black, one Spanish, one white, like literally, <laughs> you know, so I'm, I'm across the board. And I don't think until I started getting a little bit older that and came to New York and started being in a few situations that it really kind of, you know, I'd look around and I'd be like, hmm, okay, I'm the only black guy here, or I'm one of two. I didn't really feel out of place, for se, or, you know, I didn't feel any of those things. But once I started becoming more conscious of the subtle things, then certain things started looking a little bit different to me, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and just, like, even something as simple as only getting to solo on blueses, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it was like, what's up with this? So, you know, but <laughs> cool, I'll play, but what's up with that? <laughs> you know, like, so it's just the little subtle thing. And then my conscience started to grow. I've never, I'm blessed to have never had any truly bad experiences that I couldn't handle racially on the bandstand. That's a blessing. But I know that's not the case for a lot of us, you know? And as we go in, I want to get into, you've been educating for quite a while. You've taught at like a lot of different institutions. Um, and some of my best friends came from uh, one of the institutions that you've taught at uh, Oberlin. Um, yeah, uh, my roommate at for a while was Kevin Lewis, trumpet player. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so 
he introduced me, he also introduced me to Jason Brown, who is a great drummer, another Oberlin guy. Ooh. All these guys became like my best friends, you know, and oh, we wow. just had this connection. And I was like, yeah, they were there like, when I first went to Oberlin. Yeah. And, and that's kind of how I really started to, I knew about your music before, but I really get, got into it because, mostly because of Jason. Um, he had this album, um, I think it's called Get To It. Yeah. Yeah. He had that album and he was playing it all the time at our place, like all the time. And I was just like, man, this is like killing, you know, and it's the different times. And the. I was just like, man, I've never really heard anything like this before, you know, but that wound up being a huge influence on my compositions because I started a band with Jason Kevin, Gretchen Parlato, I mean Salim, Kelvin Shaw. It's a band called Odd Logic. Yeah. And and a lot of the songs that I wrote were based on odd meter grooves, but it all had to groove, you know, which is something that I learned from your music. You know, you write music in odd meters, but it grooves <laughs> like you can dance to it, you know. Um, and I think that that was such a huge influence on my composition how wow, did you that's, that's <laughs> yeah how did you wind up putting those like pieces together like what what influenced you to kind of go in that direction or did you just always kind of hear the music like that no i was you know i, I grew up playing funk and rock i was i didn't start playing jazz till i was 20. Hmm. And I was started, like I said, I started playing those gigs when I was like 14 and 15. So I, I had a five years of, of playing gigs and stuff mm -hmm. under my belt. And it was all straight up cover tunes and, you know, mm -hmm. Cool the Gang and Earth, Wind and Fire and some Chicago and Chaka Khan stuff and, you know, all, all, all that, all that stuff. And, um, and then I, I and I, and then I was also into like Led Zeppelin, Grand mm. Funk, and all these. I mean, serious rock bands like a lot of British rock bands. And mm. uh, as a, yes, I was remember I was with the song. I was like I liked Frank Zappa also, mm. and and, uh, and then I when I started hearing. Um, uh, my the album that really changed my outlook on my composition and and all kinds of stuff was this a band called the Mahavishnu Orchestra. Mm -hmm. John McLaughlin, Billy Cobham was playing the drums, and Jan Hammer was on keyboards, and they had a violin, Jerry Goodman, and it was kind of Rick Laird on the bass, and and they were playing it. Everything was just about is an odd meter, and I was I couldn't even tap my foot to it. I was like, "What are you doing?" <laughs> and then I started trying to learn how to count the stuff, and and then I was then if we were able to count it, I was able to groove with it a little bit and follow it, and it was it was so intriguing to me. that mm. I'd never heard music in different time signatures before, but but then I just started kind of combining that with like um, uh, James Brown stuff mm -hmm. and uh, and the music that I was listening to. And I, I was also into Chick's band, Return to Forever. It has Stanley Clark and Lenny White in it. And um, so it was, it was, so it was just kind of became a kind of thing to do. And then I started feeling songs from listening to my Vision Orchestra so much and Return of Forever and that whole fusion thing. I was really into that. And then um, I, I got I was got seriously into all this fusion, electronic fusion stuff. <coughs> and uh, and actually, it was during that period that I started. Exper first start experimenting with uh, adding electronics to the trombone. Yes. You know, and I grew up with a guitar player. Um, <laughs> and um, right. so I was listening to see here what they're doing. And and then it just started um, just trying to play along with some of the Mahavishnu Orchestra songs or just playing the melody and 
just trying to feel how to how to improvise and feel the rhythms and stuff in in five or thirteen or eleven yeah. or whatever, all these odd number of beats in the measure or in the phrase. And it, it just kind of the songs just kind of developed out of out of that, you know, composition. Yeah. The stuff just really influenced me so much. And then it just started feeling natural to yeah. do it. And then yeah. I used to write songs and I would hear a groove in my head. And back then I would have to, I didn't have an iPhone to sing it into or anything. I'd have to, I remember riding that, riding home on the subway in New York and trying to sing something in my head all the way till I got home to the keyboard. <laughs> and some, yes. Somebody um, say something to you and it right, you're like <laughs> you up and you try to go back to it and it never sounds the same. Never the same, yep. <laughs> but all that all those 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 kinds of experiences really um got got me into doing it. And then we started playing with um when I moved to New York, <clears throat> there was other musicians I was thinking in a similar way. We 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 formed a, a collective called uh, M Base hmm. back in the eighties, and it was with like Greg Osby and Jerry Allen and um, Steve Coleman and hmm. Cassandra Wilson. Terry Lynn Carrington was playing, and hmm. and, and um, we were all really really good friends, and we all lived in Brooklyn, and we we hmm. started this kind of music collective to, to try and come up with music that represented our generation and our and our lifespan. It's because instead of trying to play all the things you are all the time and right. playing the jazz standards, which was fine, but for me, I discovered I, I was I got really really fortunate because um, I met Slide Hampton. Mm. When, um, right after I graduated from college, I was still in Philly and he um, came to town to play at this club in Philly. And um, he had just, he just or arranged this album for Dexter Gordon called mm. Sophisticated Giants and Woody Shaw was on it. And, yeah. and, uh, and he came to play and Al Gray, who was another good, a good friend of mine who also lived in Philadelphia, mm. His um, son, Mike Gray, also played trombone. It was playing in one of the other local funk bands in our neighborhood. Oh, okay. And uh, Al was at the uh, at the uh, show that uh, Slide was playing, and he saw me in the audience, and, and Al introduced me to Slide, and Slide asked me if I had my horn with me. And I said, yeah. So he <laughs> <laughs> it's like what he do I say? What do I say? Yeah. <laughs> he asked me if I wanted to sit in on the next set. And he had never seen me before in his life. He just yeah. introduced me to us. I said, wow. okay. That <laughs> in and played a couple of songs. This is the first time I had never met Slide and never heard wow. him play. Wow. And um and at the end of the night, he asked me to join this World of Trombones band he had in, in New York. I was wow. like, I was like, really? <laughs> <laughs> wow. So I, went, I went up to New York and was started. That's how I started going to New York. I wow. took, went up there to, to rehearse with the band and Slide gave me keys to his apartment. Wow. This kind of took me under his wing and I used to follow him around around um New York to all the clubs and you know, he's walking into the Vanguard and they'd let him in and say, I'm with him. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, got know, I got to know all the all the doormen and they started yeah. letting me in. I started getting in the clubs free. I was like yeah. I said, This is like cool. It's all right. <laughs> Start playing in bands with slide and practicing with him and is when I met, <clears throat> that's how I met Steve Ture mm -hmm. and uh, Janice Robinson was another great tr trombone player. She was playing the other lead part. It was like mm -hmm. nine trombones. Doug Proviance was in yeah. the band and Clifton Anderson and Emmett McDonald, Clarence Banks. Yeah. Oof. It was, yeah. <laughs> it, 
at that time the whole it was all all black trombone players and it was it was it was a, a great a great way for me to get introduced to New York for sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's um kind of the way this series started was by the Black Excellence Trombone Choir that Weston Sprott put together mm -hmm. and like bringing us all together it was really just to see all of us you know on the same screen and and doing our thing and all these different genres it was really what inspired me to start talking about these different inside stories because our perspective like this type of stuff is shared between us you know at the bar after a gig or something like that but never is it really put down for people to understand how all these pieces come together because what you just said it remind like i've heard the stories that and you can confirm whether this is true or not i heard that you kind of got your practice and work ethic from slide hampton um yes, and yes. and the way i i can confirm that i remember when we went to cuba with steve Therese band that's the only time i've ever been to cuba um and we played i forget where we were staying but i remember you practicing in your hotel room now i'm i was like 20 at the time maybe 21 maybe um so i'm just kind of like geeking out i was probably standing outside your door for a little bit listening to what you're doing and then it went on and it went on and it went on and you shed like the whole day. And in my mind, I was like, how is he going to play the gig? You know, just, I had no idea of, <laughs> you know, how to create and stand. And then you got on the gig and you just destroyed the gig. <laughs> and I was, and I heard from somebody, yeah, Robin got his practice, you know, work ethic from hanging with slide. So you telling me that story that I guess that kind of confirms that there's oh, truth to that. I, yeah. I, you know, he's, I mean, this, this guy I just only heard on record and then I just met and then he's inviting me to come, <laughs> to come, to come play in his band in New York. I was trying to impress him and I used to stay at his, stay at his you know, I didn't know anybody in New York, so I stayed with him and we would, I would practice uh, he practiced all day long. Mm -hmm. So, and I was like, wow. So I guess that means I got to practice. <laughs> oh, and I, man. I, used to, I used to play a long tones before I went to bed. Mm. First thing in the morning before I even took a piss. Mm. <laughs> you pick up I was more. playing long tones. I, mean, I want this guy to know that I'm serious. Wow, wow. <laughs> I was trying to impress him, and I guess it worked. Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> man. He, I... he, he took me all around New York, and it was kind of introduced me to the whole scene. He introduced me to Woody Shaw at the, at the mm. Vanguard, and, and you know, Slide was everything for me. He, he yeah. Did, did so much for me and, and then he started using me and he had a band called the CBA Collective Black Artists hmm. and I was playing in some of that he used to put <clears throat> he was like 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 one of the top arranger cats obviously mm -hmm. yeah so he was leading all these different ensembles and putting stuff together and and he would use trombone players from the world of trombones and plug mm -hmm. them Eve did a lot of that stuff and and he had an, another group called the Jazz Masters that he did a little bit later. Yep. So it was, you know, and um, and then when I, you know after I started playing with Slide and doing stuff, then I started doing other gigs like in Philadelphia. Like when I moved to New York, then I started doing getting more gigs in Philly. <laughs> at gigs, I, I kept, went back and was doing a lot of uh, session dates at uh, Philly International. Good stuff mm. for OJ's, Teddy Pendergrass, and yeah. Patty LaBelle, and wow. all, all, all these kind of groups. And then, and, and then went on. I, 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 was, I was on some of the first uh, hip hop records. Oh. Uh, um, the Sugar Hill Gang. Oh, wow. <laughs> Flash, is Furious Five. Or, Damn. <laughs> Damn, did not know that. <laughs> Oh, wow. 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 In Englewood and Sugar, and, uh, Sugar Hill Records. So, oh, yeah. wow. Wow. That's, uh, it's, it's so interesting because like, like you said, Sly didn't know you from anybody, 
but he saw you and, you know, you saw Al Gray, you know, and he probably saw the lineage. I think our master. I didn't even put that's a, you know, <clears throat> a great observation. I never, I didn't even put that together because I was like, why would this cat ask me to get <laughs> in? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's. He just met me five minutes ago. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I never and I, heard and but it was probably because Al introduced me to him. I didn't yeah. have, I never even put that together. You know, and I think the 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 passing on of the leg, you know, we were a lot better at passing on things like that. You know, now it's it's a little bit different because of technology and all of these things, but that type of thing is so important because the people that are older than us, they know. <laughs> you know, we need right. to keep this lineage going. I almost you know. have said something to to slide. Yeah, <clears throat> I wasn't they, aware of. Yeah, they. they I, just, I was just in shock. I would. I didn't even <laughs> stuff together. Yeah, and not until you just said that. That after all these years, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's it's funny because like I think about it now too. I think about what young Tremonis could watch this. You know, and that be passing the torch you know i'm i just mm -hmm. turned 40 recently like that i still got a long way to go but i'm not the youngest guy in the band anymore you know and i remember I remember when i was the youngest guy in the band that was a yeah. long time. <laughs> <laughs> and i remember that feeling of just like looking at people like yourself slide steve turret i was just like kind of in awe but i always remember what my trombone teacher told me in high school he was like you're 15 now, I'm 30. But when I'm 45 and you're 30, we're going to be on the bandstand together and it's not going to make a difference, <laughs> you know? So soak up as much as you can and just like understand as much as you can from then. And it's similar now, you know, time is just moving forward. So seeing, you know, Slide is fortunately still with us. Um, I've been fortunate to just start to connect with him like over, I'd say the last three or four years, I was able to sit down with him, play with him. When I was doing that TV show, I was mm -hmm. like, we need to get Slide on here. <laughs> um, and he, he came and he wasn't feeling well the day that he was supposed to play, but he did come and check out the show. And afterwards, he just kind of, you know, held my hand and was like, don't stop doing what you're doing. You no, know, I, I think he just saw similar what he saw in you, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, and keeping that lineage going. Um, that, that's definitely something that I've tried to do through, you know, teaching. I mean, I, I was like a tenure professor at Oberlin for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And there was, you know, there's been some trombone players that passed through that have, that have been really, really, really good. And, and, uh, uh, they, at least they told me I was uh, instrumental in helping them move on. And one of them was uh, uh, Corey Wilcox. Oh, yeah. Captain and, Monster. Yeah, he was, <laughs> he was great when he was, was 18. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fantastic trombone player. Yeah, but so, and, uh, you know, but, it, but there's been uh, others, you know, there's uh, Andy Hunter and um, yep. uh, John Aarons. And, oh, yeah. Did you teach uh, Andre Merchantson also? Andre, yeah. Yep, yeah. yep. <laughs> yeah, so I'm mad. Yeah. Andre's really, I remember he came to this, the first lesson he came to and he said, he, 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 I said, so what, so what do you want to do? I used to, when I used to approach, I think I might have said it back then, but I got into this thing where I used to really try to instill in the students um, how precious this time that we had together was and how fast it was going to go. I should say, mm -hmm. I said, we have four days that's it, together in your four years. And they would always look at me like it was weird, but we had like, we had like 13 week semesters, yeah. like one hour a week. So we did two semesters, like 26 hours. So yeah, that's yeah. like one day. Yeah. Year. So I said, yeah. if you think of it, these four years is four days mm. and you'll really <clears throat> be able to comprehend how, yeah. how precious this time is and you need to really put in the work. Oof. And the first lesson I had with Andre, he said, uh, he said, I said, so what do you want? He said, I want to do what you do. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> he put in, he, you know, he worked hard. You know, he went through his stuff. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. But he, but he, you know, and I, I, I did some. I think I, I did a gig with um, Ravi Coltrane or something, and he, and I couldn't make one of the nights, and and he kind of he subbed and for me, and and we did some other some other stuff since then. I heard some recordings, and he, he sounds great. He's fantastic, man. And it's, and it's just so uh, rewarding to yeah. hear. You know, yeah. that, I knew him, had him from when he was 18 to 22 and something. And the, <laughs> those four days you had with him made a life <laughs> lifetime difference. <laughs> That's an no, excellent it's, it's great. But, I, of it. but I've definitely been trying trying to pass on stuff, you know, and, and, you know, and at Oberlin, anytime I saw in any, any of the students, cause I, I opened up my lessons to uh, everybody I opened it up to the whole mm-hmm. conservatory. So I had, oh, wow. I had um, trombone players, I had trumpets, sax, mm. you know, wow. drums and, you know, wow. um, all, all kinds of stuff. Pianos, Sullivan Fortner took some secondary oh, wow. lessons. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and, uh, I, 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 you know, Casa overall took some yeah. secondary lessons with wow. me. Wow. <clears throat> and it was, you know, it was a, it was a nice uh, program there. And, and, and there was some black students come through and I, you know, I'd always try to pull them aside and, you know, was, you know, you need any help, you need anything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a testament to you as a great teacher, but more so as a great person, you know, and understanding all of those those things that you've been through, how to give it back. You know, that's so important. Um, I want to kind of morph into a little bit of the current state that we're in as far as a country and just the people, you know, I'm a. Uh, I'm going to brag on another one of your compositions now. So back when I was in high school, you know, sometimes you hear a record or a recording and then you don't hear it for like 20 years and then you hear it again and it's just a totally different meaning. So one of those records was the uh, J.J. Johnson Brass Orchestra um, and your composition on there, Cross Currents, um, was something that I remember, I remember listening to that record when I was in high school, but then I kind of just hadn't listened to it for a long time. All my CDs are packed up and all this stuff. And maybe a couple of months ago, I was out on a dog walk and I came across that record. And I was like, oh man, I haven't heard this in a long time. Let me put it on. And when your song Cross Currents came on, I literally, it, it, it took me to such a different place because the imagery that was in my mind at that time was everything that was going on. It's the Breonna Taylor, it's the George Floyd. We're just getting flooded with all of this imagery. But then that song became the soundtrack in my mind for all of this imagery. Wow. All right. So the the groove that was going, like, that groove just kind of encapsulated, like, to me, you know, this is, of course, just my thing, everything that was kind of going on, you know, it was t- intense, it was tense, it's like you didn't know where it was going, there's all these little things, and then there's this, like, quick release of swing in the song, and then goes back to that groove, and yeah. that was kind of like when we get a chance to just like breathe, and then we're back in the, the shit, <laughs> you know? Um, so that composition really, for me, I mean, it, it literally brought tears to my eyes because of how I put all of that together in my mind, you know? Could you just tell me, just so I know, what is that song Cross Currents about? It could be about like the water and birth, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but- well, it was, it was- uh, first of all, man, this is this. Uh, thank you for everything you're saying. I, like I said before, early, you, I, I just do what I do. I don't know yeah. what how it's affecting people or what's. I, I, I like it. So yeah. that's, all, that's all I can judge is whether I like it or not. Yeah. But thanks. But uh, it was um, actually, um, I got to know JJ. Uh, well. 
First of all, I, I met when I was hanging with Slide. To me, Slide was the cat. I had never heard nobody play sl- trombone like that. Yeah. And, um, and the fact that he was letting me into his life and into his home, literally, yeah. <laughs> was just mind blowing. So yeah. I, was, I was like, I want, I really appreciate what this guy, is, this man is doing for me. And I want him to know how much I appreciate it. So I worked my ass off and, mm-hmm. and let him know that I was working my ass off. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so, and, he was, and he was composing and I, he would sit, remember he had an apartment on Thompson street near Bleecker and Thompson, right down the mm-hmm. street from um, village gate mm-hmm. was on the corner. And, um, I was I was, I was sitting there. He would he had old tired ass record player. <clears throat> he would have this record, JJ Johnson first place on mm-hmm. you know, one of those drums. You lift the arm up and the, mm-hmm. the, the play and then the, the, we start playing again. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> I remember coming out of one little tiny speaker or yep. something. Yep. And he played that record. He would just take the arm up and just play it all day long. Wow. And I was, I was listening. I'm, I'm just soaking all this in. I don't know anything. And mm. and Sly was, was sitting in his robe at the table doing big band arrangements. Mm. No piano, <laughs> just a pencil yeah. Yeah. and manuscript paper. Mm-hmm. And I would just look at him doing that and it's like, how can you hear what it sounded like without the piano, without, yeah, not, yeah, no. he didn't even play a note on the trombone. He just, yeah. write. <laughs> and I was, I was amazed. Yeah. And, um, and uh, he would just play, you know, just write. And, and he, he just, so then he, he's, and I would just, idolized him and he, he said Robin don't listen to me he said listen to JJ hmm. and I was you know and I used to I used to like J, I used to like JJ and he I mean he was the first trombone player in jazz that I really really got into but yeah. JJ always sounded so perfect right and I, he didn't like crack notes or I like I was just like man I like hearing people reaching for stuff and mm-hmm. trying and sometimes not making it. Right. And Slide told me he said, "Well, how hard is it to sound perfect?" Mm. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's when I started really appreciating JJ. That's heavy playing and the sound and articulation and everything and and then um, JJ came. Um, j- j- he was, I think he was, he was, I think it's either he went back to Indianapolis. I'm from forgetting the sequence because he was writing in Hollywood for a while, but he came out of kind of retirement and started playing again. Mm-hmm. And he, he came back to play in New York for the first time. And, and like, he put, had that band together with Ralph Moore and Rini Rosnes, I think was playing right. piano and Rufus Reed. Mm-hmm. And um, they played at the Vanguard, and Slide had got got a scroll together, and had all the trombone players in New York sign it. Oh, and wow! He, he presented it to JJ on stage wow. on his. In the, for, I think it was on that opening night that JJ played in, in at the at the Vanguard. Wow! And that's the first time I had ever heard JJ play live. And then Slide introduced me to him, and he said, "Yeah, I've heard of you. I, I, I didn't, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't know if he really did or not. He just turned it feel good. But we became, we became friends. Hmm. And, you know, because he had a bulletin board online that he used to write. He was a big Indianapolis Colts fan. Oh, okay. <laughs> He's living in Indianapolis. And Slide yep. was in Indianapolis also. Yep. Yep. And a whole lot of, you know, Montgomery brothers and yep. <clears throat> Freddie there's Hubbard. A, there's a great book that talks about that. Uh, I'm forgetting. Let me see if it's on my shelf. Um, it might be somewhere back there, but uh, it's about the Indianapolis jazz scene <laughs> and yeah, all the was, cats that came from there. Serious, serious cats. Yeah. So, so he introduced me to, to Slide introduced me to J, JJ and, um, and then uh, uh, later on, um, I started um, 
when I was working with Art Blakey, mm-hmm. uh, JJ was, was send me little notes and stuff. He's wow. you know, right, and, and I, I got I got notes from JJ written in his handwriting and stuff. Wow. And, and he would just pass on little notes if we were at the same jazz festival and just said hi and stuff like that. Okay. So, and then we would talk on this bulletin board and things like that. And I used to call him every year on his birthday to say mm. happy birthday and yeah. all that much. We loved him and appreciated him. And um, and then when he, st- when he started he, when this record, he was playing, he was recording for Verve at the time. And then when the brass orchestra thing came together, he, I guess I sent him some of my music or something, some of my recordings, and, and he said, I'm putting this project together. It's like going to be like a culmination of all my career and all this stuff. And he said, I want you to write one of those funny time signature songs. <laughs> for the recording. And then um, I wrote it. And then, you know, but I, I you know, I, I was, so I was, I was like, JJ Johnson's asking me to write something on his recording. Yeah. It's like so strange. To write. <laughs> but I said, I'm going to do it. And so Once again, gonna, they passed the he, torch, man. These kids re- knew. And he requested an, one, an odd meter thing. Hmm. I want, he said, I think that would balance the record out. One of those funny time signature songs yeah. that you do. So I wrote this song and I, you know, because it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, I think it's a, the first sections of the five. Dun, dun, mm-hmm. da, 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 da. Mm-hmm. So this is divided like in three and two. So the three I divided, subdivided into two. The, 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 like two dotted quarter notes, da, mm-hmm. da, and the two I subdivided into three. So oh, the two one, two, made three. it made it into a dotted court dotted tri- or a quarter note triplet. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Da, 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 mm-hmm, da. So mm-hmm. the three beats got subdivided into two and the three ah, okay. two beats got subdivided into three. So it, okay. it kind of gives this kind of uh, swishy kind of yeah. feel. Yeah. It, and and um and uh, I, I forget how I came up with doing the sweet. So I remember I used to like to try to throw swing in because a, a lot of this and we used to do some of the straight ahead songs. Sometimes they would just throw it, you know, they just go into a Latin beat for a couple right. of measures and then go swing back to the swing. We just swing Latin on the bridge and then right, right. I was trying to reverse it. So I had this kind of five Latin Afro whatever Cuban mm-hmm. kind of five thing. And then I would use the swing as a release instead of using mm-hmm. Latin as a release. Mm-hmm. And I, I didn't even I don't I, I don't I don't name the songs until after I write them right that i was listening to it and it reminded me of, of kind of like some stuff you know just turbulence and stuff mm-hmm. going on and mm-hmm. mixing up and switching around so that's why i called it cross currents mm-hmm. was, was was because just after listening to it when after i finished writing it and composing it and listening back to it and this that's what it reminded me of yeah. And one of the things about that recording that was also in keeping with what you were saying about passing the torch is that, um, you know, I wrote the song and I told JJ, so I so explaining all this stuff to him about it. And it's like, you know, it goes and it's, uh, you know, it's a little, might, you know, it might be a little different, but you'll pick, you'll get, you'll hear it, you know, work on it. He said, oh, no, no, you're playing it. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I didn't, didn't want you to write it for me. You do it. <laughs> I said, but the, I says, what are you going to do? <laughs> he said, I'm listening. It was a J.J. A Johnson record. That Ver- wow. Jay didn't even play on the song. Wow. <laughs> why, why is he having one of my songs on his record that he's not even playing on. That's incredible. <laughs> and then Slide wrote a song called Comfort, called Comfort Zone that he wrote mm-hmm. for JJ. 
And JJ said, I want you to play on this too. Mm, wow. Jay didn't play on it. So it was, it was like, it was like, I didn't, I just, I said, don't question it. Just, just yeah. go. Yeah. But he was, but I, I literally felt like he was like passing this, t- passing the torch on. Like yeah. He was man. And yeah. he was the person that recommended me for the Oberlin position. Hmm. Cause he wow. taught at, he taught at Oberlin for like a, a a year or a semester or something. He taught he taught Jason Jackson and Jason was, was oh, with wow. that, at Oberlin. Wow. <clears throat> the position opened up and, and and Wendell Logan, who's director of the program, he told me he said JJ gave me your name. Wow. <laughs> you first for this position. So wow, wow. <laughs> Well, I mean, Jay did so much for me, man. And, and, That's... And, and Bruce, you know, and my connection to him was initiated because of a personal connection was through Slide. And yeah. my connection with Slide was, was initiated through Al Gray. Right. <clears throat> so the cats, they, you know, and then, you know, and now that I'm at the age I am now, I can see how you, you kind you can recognize somebody who's serious about doing this mm-hmm. and, and you really appreciate it. Yeah. I remember Curtis Fuller told me one time when I met him in New York, because he was playing, he was doing a thing with a two trombone thing with, with Kai Wending. Oh, huh. And, and uh, he told me, he said, and I think this is, this was after I already started playing with art. He said, he said, I've been waiting for somebody like you to come along for a while. Hmm. Hmm. And I, was, I just took that to heart. I said, this is Curtis Fuller. <laughs> <laughs> Man. Man, that's Man. Me. I was like, yeah, I was like, wow. I yeah. Like, I mean, it, people, people really, need to understand like how important just that little spark from oh, somebody yeah. who we not only idolize but i definitely think you know that looks like us you know that we see like this image of ourselves and it's like really well if you say i can do it then i can do it you know and it just instills this confidence in us that it's it, you can't get that from anywhere else. You know, it's like when your parents say good job, the positive reinforcement, you know, that whole thing. It's so important, you know, especially as a musician, because art is so subjective. You know, we can think we're great. But if Curtis was like, man, you know, you don't sound that you need to work on it. You know, that's what you would go after. But he said, no, I've been waiting for somebody like you, you know, not to be like me, I mean, to be like you. <laughs> you know, it made me practice so much more yeah. and feel confident that I'm doing the right thing and, yeah. and going along the right path. And, and I mean, and, and I, I actually got to a point where I, I had a little falling out with Slide. So we had some, uh, we're, we're great now. I talked mm-hmm. to him about a month ago. Mm-hmm. And, um, but because I was trying, I, I went through the, this period where when I was living with Slide, hearing him play every day and practicing, you know, I'm, kept, my brother Kevin and I lived in Slide's, uh, he had a brownstone in, in Brooklyn on Carlton mm-hmm. Avenue, right off the Calvin Carlton, 245. Mm-hmm. Carlton. And um, Kevin and I were renting the top floor of the of the house from Slide, so I heard Slide playing all day long Man. underneath me, <laughs> and and I'm trying to play my little stuff, and and he was telling me to listen to JJ, and I'm listening to him, and I was like, man, I'm never gonna sound like these guys. I'm never yeah. gonna sound like Slide or sound like JJ, and. You know, and at that point, Slide and JJ were both playing and, and at the top of the game. Yeah. So I was like, what am I doing? I said, I need to sound like me. Yeah. Because I'm never going to sound like them. Yeah. And and I got to this point where I was like, well, who am I? And I didn't yeah. have a good answer for that. And I went through this whole mm. period just searching and 
I just wasn't listening to music for, I was trying to stop listening. I'll go to bed listening to, to the <clears throat> tapes of the ocean or birds mm. and all these mm. natural sounds and try to clear my ears out. And then I, at the end of it, I, be, I became a Buddhist. Oh, wow. and, and Steve Terray was one of the people that got me started in Buddhism. Hmm. And I've been practicing Buddhism for 37 years. Wow. wow. Every day. Wow. And, um, it's a, and that really helped me um, open up to what I wanted to do and help me develop my um, personal, personalize my sound and my compositions and everything it was, it was definitely spurred on hmm. <clears throat> by my practicing of Buddhism. Hmm. And, and when I started really diving into that and um and you know and doing all this stuff and then we were doing the stuff with m base this was like 83 when i started chanting became, mm. became a buddhist and but then i started trying to do stuff that sound like myself and then i started doing more stuff with electronics and playing stuff in odd time signatures and I, so I was like, what is he, do? what are you doing? <laughs> 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 he, he, he was in one of the bands that he was, because he used to hire me for all his bands. But then yeah. I started trying to go into my own direction. And he was like, he said, Robin, he said, in this band is about swinging and the blues. <laughs> None of that funny stuff. Right. <laughs> and I'll get to my solo. I'm working on my funny stuff. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> I know I can't play like him. Yeah. I had yeah. to come up with my own stuff, and he, he wasn't feeling it. And he, he, he stopped giving me solos in the band and uh, all that uh, stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we're cool now. But yeah. Just, you know, you, you, you also got to know when to to go for your own. Yeah. No, it's, a, it's about really respecting and, um, and showing homage and res and the, about the lineage, but yeah, the lineage continues because another branch is formed off of it. It's, it's, it's not That's just, right. the, it's not the flat line. That's right. <laughs> so That's right. So JJ took his, stuff to he took his stuff to a different level and in a different direction that was happening I'm, I'm not comparing myself to jj by, by any means like i said before at the very beginning of the interview i just do what i do yeah let the chips fall where they fall yeah and, and that's and that was i had to follow what i my, you know follow my heart or whatever you want to call it or just be myself basically yeah. and and you know because of the um growing up playing funk and rock and then getting into the odd meters and listening to all these rock bands and then and then really embracing all the jazz and you know and playing and i grew up playing uh, playing salsa bands in philly and got to play mm -hmm. eddie palmieri's band and um you know the stuff with chucho valdez you know so it was a lot of different influences happening yeah so I just, I, you know, so I just continue to, to go in my own direction and, and I'm, and I'm still doing that. I'm, yes. I'm working on stuff today that's, that's different from what I was doing before, but you know, it's Maybe. in the same trajectory, but it's yeah. just, things are just at a different <laughs> level now. And, yeah. and, and I love it. I mean, it's, yeah. it's hard, but that's, it's frustrating sometimes, but what else am I going to do? Yeah, I mean, now during this pandemic, I got more time to do it than I hopefully will ever. Have. <laughs> so so agreed. Yeah, so, sometimes like at least I found for myself, if you're if you're not in an extremely adverse situation, you're not really going to push yourself, you know, as hard as you could, you know. So sometimes well, that. that that's a whole, that's a Buddhist concept that right mm. there. It's just, mm. you know, how, how, you know, adversity and obstacles are opportunities without those mm. you won't grow. Yes. You yes. Just, you'll flatline, you know, yeah. just, there, and there are people who, who have, you know, reached uh, 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 different levels of success 
and 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 they're like chilling. They're like, yeah. I made it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they and they and they and, they, and they're like doing that for. They can do that for the next twenty years, and they'll be happy. Yeah. And that you know, more power to them. That's what they want to do. That's not what I want to do. Yeah. I'm, I'm, you know, I do like I tell my students, or when I'm doing the lectures, you know, I'm, I'm busting my ass to get through this, open this door that's locked yeah. in front of me, musically mm-hmm. or conceptually or whatever. Yeah. And then I finally open the door, and you see four more doors. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's yeah, like you gonna, yeah. are you gonna push yourself to open the next door or are you just gonna yeah. chill where you are and yeah i'm i'm constantly trying to open that next door yeah and that, that's what i do and that's that's I, I i really like it you know it's frustrating and sometimes it's hard to do but mm-hmm. you know like this period now with this pandemic we, we all of us i mean yourself included obviously You've never had this much free time. Never. <clears throat> never. And hopefully, and never, hopefully never will. <laughs> like you said, hopefully not. But I feel like if if we didn't have this time, we might not be sitting here having this conversation. Oh, you know, wow, so we, we didn't like, before. <laughs> yeah, you know, and we actually live close to each other. Like, right. You know, uh, but it's it's kind of it's kind of that. You know, I want to ask you one more question, you know, with everything that's kind of gone on politically and all that, I I didn't realize that that you were practicing uh, Buddhist. How do you, I guess this advice could go for musicians and non-musicians. How do you go about keeping, or what advice could you give to people for keeping themselves grounded throughout adversity? Well, I would definitely try to find some kind of practice that keeps you grounded. Period. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. you know, and on the, and something that you can come back to that's going to bring you back to your center and and help you really um, be as delusion free as possible. Because. <laughs> um, um, you know, for me, it's, it's, it's Buddhism and I highly, highly recommend it, but that's not, it's going to be everybody's choice, obviously, but so find whatever it is that's going to <clears throat> help, help you, um, not be swayed by problems or success. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, success can take you left just as fast as adversity. You're right. <laughs> and so it's like a middle way yeah. of, of, of being that's going to keep you keep keep you grounded and and something that you know and you'll know it works from your experience. Yeah. You yeah. try it and you know when I first started chant practicing Buddhism, they told me, you know, they, they told me some of this, you know, it's, it's just like when you start <clears throat> trying to uh, do a diet or something. As soon as you make that cause, you know, there's in physics, they're saying for each action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. <clears throat> so as soon as you make this cause, I'm not going to eat this food anymore, or I'm not going to smoke anymore, or I'm not going to drink, or whatever it is you're trying to do, then everything. So, <laughs> all in line. Get all the buffet when you know everything's trying to uh, work against it. And yeah. it's a matter of if you you can find if you can push your way and and, and and train yourself to follow that direction that you say you're going to do. And if you do it and you're successful, then <clears throat> we, what we call actual proof proof that it works. I said, yes. oh wow, yes, yes. Said it's going to happen and. <laughs> And it happens, and <clears throat> and that happens with me time and time again with practicing Buddhism. So yeah, it happens almost every day. Yeah, and and you know just really find something that um, can help help keep you centered, and and also good uh, people. You need you need strong people around you. You, mm-hmm. you need to associate with with people who are positive. And they're going to encourage you and, and, and know you and support you when you go through your stuff because 
can't no, nobody can do this can deal with all this stuff by themselves either it's family friends or mentors or however whatever it takes but you know it's for you to you know you gotta develop in a crew your 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 crew your group yeah yeah <laughs> your support group you know yeah. you, you yeah. put together you, you you create it you create your environment yeah and and you got to create an environment that's going to help sustain you yeah and and whatever that is and you know and you know and music can be one of those things that can help you but you need to play with you know, positive musicians are, are people first. So, you, yeah. you know, you got to choose wisely. <laughs> <laughs> very, very well said. <laughs> very well said. And Robin, you're the, this has been like amazing. Um, it's been absolutely amazing for me. I know it was amazing for the audience. Um, your it was amazing for me too. I remember, <laughs> remember you said it started from the the black trombone excellence, uh, yeah, and then group, and you know we were fortunate enough to work in that together. And I and, and I I didn't even know how I came across your show, and then I saw it. I said, "Oh, damn, that's, that's cool." <laughs> yeah, man. Podcasting, and I told you. I'd like to be a part of it. Yeah, I'm so happy you did. I'm so yeah, yeah. happy that I'm, you I'm, did. I'm glad that you, you 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 know you saw a void and you took the initiative and you took some action. Yeah, and you have all a part of it. It's all in the Buddhism. It's all about cause and effect. You got to yes. make make the cause to get the effect that you want in your life. You made the cause and. And I think this is going to be, you know, a really valuable resource for a lot of people. And it's I, I agree. I agree. And I, I thank you so much for adding to that. Um, you added a whole lot to it and you added a lot of value to me. You know, um, this day for me after this interview will be different, you know, because I got a chance to fellowship with you like this. So I truly appreciate you taking your time to sit down and talk with me and talk with the audience. And for anybody who wants to learn more about Robin, I'll have some links in the description to his website and different social media handles. And I wanna thank all of you for watching this episode of the Black Tremone Chronicles. If you haven't done so yet, make sure you subscribe to the Chop Shop YouTube channel. And uh, that's it for this episode of the Black Tremone Chronicles. And I'll see you next time at the Chop Shop.